still fighting against the Cameroonian government because they thought they thought that the Cameroonian government was not the legitimate government representing the people correctly and this government was imposed to the Cameroonian people by France so the party who was fighting against colonialism they all went underground and they continue the armed struggle among the people who were still fighting were Ernest Wanjie, who was a very handsome and very charismatic figure. So when we grew up, we knew that he, whenever you mentioned his name, you could go to jail. Everybody was scared of this man. And so, but he was arrested in 1970, and he was executed in 1971, despite all the protests all over the world saying, this man is a political prisoner. You cannot just arrest him and execute him. So he was executed, and at that time the legend was saying that he was executed. He didn't even answer any questions to the judge, saying that you don't even deserve to hear the sound of my voice. That's what the legend was saying when you were kids. So we really admired him as a, almost like a comic, a comic book character for us. So in the year 2000, one friend Ted told me, Oh, you know, Ernest Wanji had a daughter, and her daughter is somewhere, it lives somewhere in the region. And I was really very interested and very intrigued. And I kept, I managed to find her phone number. I kept, I called her once or twice, saying I'll come and visit. And she said, okay, no problem. So she knew my work because I was making films about colonialism. And, um, and some of my films were even banned in Cameroon. So, one day in 2004, we finally met. And I was really impressed because she was such a beautiful woman and also so intelligent and really so determined. So when we met, she started telling me the story of her life and especially her childhood. So after 10, 15 minutes we were talking, I said, well, I really need to record this because what you're saying is so surprising to me. And, and I didn't have a tape recorder. I just came like for a visit just to, go. but I had my camera in the car and it was, it was still, uh, there was still some battery and I had the tape. At that time you had these uh, 180 minutes uh, tapes and this uh, big DV cam camera. So I, I took it with me and we were sitting in the stairs outside in her house and I put the camera on my knees and I was talking to her and trying to capture what she was saying, really for the sake of having some archival material. And she told me her life, and, for, and it seemed to me she went in so much detail, and she told me so many things that I was myself sometimes totally uncomfortable because I didn't expect her to go so deep and to throw so much on me, and I didn't know what to do with that because I... I, I was trying to make something about her father. This interview was long, and sometimes it was almost like a quarrel between her and me because I thought her position were sometimes very extremist, and she thought my position were sometimes very like very French, francophone, very washy, uh, something not really very straight, strict, and clear. So we had a, a very interesting conversation for three hours, and <laughs> that's how. The, the first encounter with Ernestine. Yes, uh, so we sat there. I arrived at a place around one in the afternoon, and I left, I think I left, it was starting to get dark, so around five or six, because we started by talking a little bit, and then when she started telling me things, I started recording. And when we finished recording, I had a three hour stay, but uh, the tape was full, and then we continued having a normal, Chitty chat conversation, and uh, so I spent let's say four or five hours with her. And when I left with this interview, really I didn't know what I would do with it. I knew it was not a good interview in terms of what she would tell me about her father. 
and I didn't know how to use it. So I put it on the shelf and kept thinking, okay, if I make a film on, the, on her father, I will probably find some bits to talk to for the interview. And at that time, I was already working on various projects because 2004, I finished The Colonial Misunderstanding in 2005, and then I made Sacred Places that was finished in 2009. And I had a teaching job in the US between 2007 and 2008, and even 2009, I stayed almost three years, two years and three years in the US. And one day I read in the Cameroonian paper that she had committed suicide. I tried to get in touch with the family, it was very complicated. I finally got in touch with the husband and the husband couldn't talk. And I said to him, I tried to find out what happened and he just said, he couldn't say anything to me actually. He was almost like so devastated by the whole news and, and I respected his. And uh, I told him at one point, maybe I should make a film about her story. And he said to me, of course she wanted that, she even uh, wished that would happen. And so I started trying to see how to make a film with this material. That means three hours interview, some archival footage of the history of Cameroon, and the knowledge of the circumstances in which NS1J met the mother of Ernestine. So with this element, I tried to construct a film. My, my approach to filmmaking is almost like telling a story. And how do you tell a story like that? That also leaves the very personal story and makes it a universal story that people can follow even people who are not part of that culture. And also that tells the story of the whole group of people. So for me that was the main question. So when I listened to the interview of Ernestine, she kept referring to, she referred to herself as a leaf that was cut from the, uh, the a leaf on a branch that was cut from a tree. And I said to myself, really, the. I need to find the kind of metaphor that illustrates that. And I found out that Hegel had made this funny sentence, who was a, a sound colonialist. He said at one point, you should stop listening, crying over the falling trees, but listen to the forest that is growing. That was very interesting to, to listen rather to the forest growing, that means almost silence, and just not look at the trees that people are destroying. So for me, I, I felt this was really the very good entry point to this story. And silence that killed Ernestine was almost part of this discourse that Hegel was elaborating. Because if you, someone asked you to listen to the, for, the new forest that is growing, that means just to listen to silence, actually. And of course, I, that silence is cry, it's criminal. Uh, that silence over things is one of responsible not only of the death of Ernestine, but also of the suffering and the misery that has been going on in Africa for so long. And I can even equate it to what's happening in Lampedusa, because if the situation in Africa was not that bad, people would not be trying to flee the continent and come to Europe. And the silence over the destruction of Africa, the silence over the taking over all the resources is contributing to having all these people trying to flee the continent to come here. So I started with this metaphor to introduce this idea of Ernestine uh, as a leaf in the wind. And her silence and the silence around the destruction of Africa is such a criminal thing that I needed to have the Ernestine story revealing, actually.